Um, I feel very privileged to be up here. Um, Helga talked about stepping out of the shadow, and this presentation is about dementia coming out of the shadow in our health and care policy and practice, um, and doing, as Helga said we should, uh, investing in people's lives now. I have to say, I'm presenting other colleagues' work um, as much as my own. Lindsay Kinnaird, my colleague who developed the Eight Pillar Model, Henry Simmons and Kate Fernley, um, who refined and promoted it, Jim Pearson, who spearheaded testing the approach, and our colleagues in Scottish Government, Michelle Miller, Douglas Phillips, David Berry, and others, um, who are leading the testing process for this. I mean, we're really working in true partnership between Alzheimer's Scotland and the Scottish Government with the health boards and local authorities across Scotland on this. Um, it's a really great example of this. I'm going to begin with some of the reasoning behind the Eight Pillars model of care and support. Many of you have heard of this. It's a model of care and support for people and communities um, who are in the moderate to severe phases of, um, of their dementia journey. As is appropriate for this conference, it starts with and is based on rights of people with dementia. Um, the Charter of Rights you'll see on the, on, on the left there um, which you've heard about, developed in Scotland in 2009 um, and is the basis, providing the basis for Scotland's two national dementia strategies. The model speaks to some of the rights that we've um, affirmed in the Glasgow Declaration at this conference, particularly, I think, those final three um, about the right to person-centred, coordinated quality care, the right to equitable access to treatments and therapeutic interventions, and the right for a person to be respected as an individual within their community. It seeks to be a practical implementation of these rights, making care truly person-centred, and it's why integration is important to us at Alzheimer's Scotland. The model itself is centred around the person with dementia and promoting their quality of life. And by doing this, um, we've used Kitwood's dialectical model of the lived experience of dementia. It's dynamic, it's ever-changing, and it, that's the theoretical basis for this approach that appreciates the interplay between the specific illness of dementia and its symptoms, a person's personality and their experience and the impact that that has, and their family, social and community situation. And these all come together to say, well, this is what dementia is like for this person and this is what health and social care response there needs to be. So by doing this and looking to coordinate our interventions in a way that starts from the person, we're able to ensure that formal and informal resources combine for the greatest benefit. There are also system and resource drivers um, behind this model, which are, are why that we've been able to get it accepted by the Scottish Government and, and, and health boards and why it's being tested. Firstly, costs, they, they come into to everything we're trying to do with the public sector, really. Um, it's about how to make improvements, agreed as we all are, that these improvements are badly needed. The Cabinet Secretary for Health said so yesterday, as did the founder of the Scottish Dementia Working Group. Even they agree on that, about, about these m moderate stages of dementia. When you have, though, no extra money, no extra resource, we need to use existing resources more effectively. The systemic drivers are about the wider health and social care policy in Scotland, and that's what I've put up on that slide there, drivers about preventing hospital admission and other institutional admission. Um, the Scottish Government estimate that it costs £4,600 to keep somebody in hospital for a week. Um, it's a lot cheaper if we can get it right and keep them at home. It actually means that we end up spending less money in the system and they're therefore able to support more people. So that's not just about dementia. So these drivers, in particular the drivers about rights um, and about people with dementia um, having power and having control, they lie behind Scotland's famous 12-month post-diagnostic support guarantee. And this is the model that we use in terms of implementing that 12 months of post-diagnostic support. This is the five-pillar model developed also by Alzheimer's Scotland 
and it's the specified model of delivery for the Scottish Government's targets on, on post-diagnostic support. Um, we came at the eight pillars because we looked at this and, and, and realised it would be wrong to provide this high-quality support, a personalised framework and the guaranteed consistency of having a link worker supporting you through this year without looking to provide similar levels of quality and of personalisation for the thousands of people who are facing more challenging issues later on in their dementia journey. So these models connect together the five pillars and the eight pillars. And this diagram demonstrates Alzheimer Scotland's vision for how post-diagnostic support fits at the beginning of a system of support that lasts throughout the dementia journey. So post-diagnostic support lasts for a year, and it enables a period of self-management, hopefully, depending on when the person's diagnosis happens, and then leads on to a fully integrated package of personalised support as symptoms progress. And that is what uses the eight pillar model, which is this, the title of, our pre of this presentation. And this is our solution. We like to have solutions in Alzheimer's Scotland. And this is our solution to the problems that were posed yesterday by the cabinet secretary. Dementia is an illness that requires treatment. But the majority of the treatment, as we have heard from several speakers, is human intervention. It's a range of therapeutic, psychological, um, psychosocial interventions which can tackle the symptoms and enhance coping. And it's why the concept of integration is so important to this approach. Each set of interventions must be cohesive and personalized to each individual so that they can have maximum benefit. And this is the approach that recognizes and supports the human rights and citizenship of people with dementia and enables them to participate as fully as possible in our society. I'm just going to briefly go through what each of these pillars are. that will be revision for many of you. The linchpin of the model is the dementia practice coordinator, a single point of contact for the person with dementia and for their families and supporters around them. The dementia practice coordinator ensures access to all the other interventions and so needs to be a skilled practitioner to navigate and coordinate across the full range of what these might be. This role will be part of somebody's job. So it might be a community nurse or a social worker or an allied health professional, perhaps. And we're testing how well this role fits into the professional role of a range of different um, people. We have a pillar, the first pillar, about therapeutic interventions. This pillar is about enabling, tackling symptoms, and supporting coping. This might include formal support from allied health professionals or less formal inputs using music or reminiscence, possibly spiritual engagement, or enabling participation in creative or physical activities that enhance people's lives and keep them active and keep their brains happy. General healthcare and treatment is very important. This pillar centers on the GP with specialist intervention as necessary. Um, in this pillar, we need to consider the impact of other conditions, comorbidities, as the phrase is, both pre-existing and emerging while somebody has dementia, both chronic conditions and acute conditions. And here, a key concern, I think, is avoiding both under-treatment and over-treatment, both of which can happen if somebody has dementia and is why we need um, a broad range of healthcare practitioners to have an awareness of dementia and the impact it might have on people. Mental health care and treatment is of equal importance, particularly as um, depression is so common um, as, a, as, a, as a condition that, alongside dementia. The environment is very important. This pillar is about housing, the home environment largely, um, so getting housing right, including aids and adaptations or assistive technology perhaps, can maintain independence, promote safety, so things like falls prevention, and improve the well-being of the person with dementia and the people they're living with. So this pillar involves housing professionals and occupational therapists, for example. <coughs> Maintaining community connections is hugely important. Um, and, and that community resilience, we've heard a lot about throughout this conference, actually. 
Um, it's a vital factor in maintaining independence. Um, this involves the work going on in Scotland, in the rest of the UK, and elsewhere in Europe um, to make communities dementia friendly. Um, it's crucial to ensuring that this piece of the jigsaw fits, that communities are, inclu are inclusive of people with dementia. This pillar around personalised support is about social care and social work. Uh, it's about personalised, supportive, dementia spe specialist and enabling social care. And it should be focused on the outcomes that the person with dementia seeks to achieve. So, it's about, so it needs to be really involving um, somebody and their families in their own care. And that might be social workers, it might be other allied health professionals as well who are involved in delivering this pillar. And finally, and the reason these are all in a circle is because there's no hierarchy in these, okay? So don't read anything into the order in which I'm talking about them. This pillar is about support for carers. The lived experience of dementia is shared. And this pillar recognizes that and recognizes that support for doing the caring role and support for the carer themselves in terms of the life that they wish to leave is important in supporting the person with dementia, but also in supporting the carer's own rights to a quality of life and to be making a contribution to society as a citizen. So this will include healthcare, it'll include education, it'll include respite, it'll include peer support. And it, again, it should be tailored around the needs of the person who we're dealing with. We're currently testing this model. We're not quite halfway through the testing period, so come back at the beginning of 2016, I think, for results. Um, and we're testing this because we aim to use this model as a basis for policy and practice around dementia support for people in this phase of the illness. And we're looking to, we're looking to see what we might include in the next dementia strategy in Scotland, which will be launched in 2016. There are five test sites. The Scottish Government are working with Alzheimer's Scotland with, with partnerships of health boards and local authorities and others who are involved. These five test sites include urban and rural areas. And as you can see from the map, they're all over Scotland. And we've got people involved in some of the test sites who have been here at the conference. So maybe you'll get a chance to speak to them. Um, over the coffee break or, or get in contact afterwards to get a real feeling for how things are going. This is the Scottish Government's stated aim around the test process um, to improve the experience, safety and coordination of care for people with dementia and their carers. Um, note underneath in the sub-objectives about people with dementia feeling supported, about people feeling safe feeling responded to, it recognises that subjective, individualised nature of the experience of dementia. We're learning in several ways from these tests. As I say, we're only, we're, we're only a wee bit of the way through, so it's still emerging outcomes. Um, we're focusing on outcomes. We're trying to be very person-centred. We're looking at both quantitative and qualitative data in order to... Um, that evidence that we're taking from the test sites. Um, so we've got quantitative data that's being recorded by professionals about numbers and about what, what interventions people are accessing. But we've also got qualitative data gathering, and this is really exciting. This is about talking to participants. It's about staff members and other participants' reflective diaries. It's really important in terms of involving people with dementia and involving their supporters um, both in their own care and how their care and support progresses but also in shaping future service models and future policy and, and it's a real opportunity for, for, for everybody involved to have an impact there. So what we're we learning so far, as I say, we're at an early stage. We're learning that change management is a big deal. Um, about coordinating information and data but in order to be able to provide a truly integrated service. We're learning that the ongoing nature of the dementia practice coordinator role, having that single point of contact, the same contact 
for what might be um, several years. That's a new way of working for a lot of the agencies we're involved with. So that's a bit of a culture shift. Um, we're learning that a lot of the approaches that I've described in those pillars around personalized outcomes and around having a point of contact even, they're approaches that already exist amongst a lot of the test sites. In some ways, we're not asking people to do things new, um, to do things that are new. We're just asking them to think about it differently and in a more coordinated way. So keep an eye out. For, you can keep an eye on the Scottish Government's new Focus on Dementia website. Um, Michelle, I said I'd plug that. I can't see where she is, but I've, um, I've, I've done that, what I said. There's, we're, there's, there's emerging findings going to be coming up onto that. Um, so I think if you, if, you, if you search on Twitter for at Focus on Dementia, you'll be able to follow the updates that are coming out of there. I've tried to provide you here with a bit of an update as to what's going on. This is what we're hoping to come out of it. We're hoping to find an effective service model. We're hoping to be able to identify how exactly we can have work with the dementia coordinator because that single point of contact is something that we just hear so much as to, you know, this is what we want, this is what we need. So we're find, trying to find a practical way of making that work. We want to be able to roll the eight pillars out across Scotland and this way of working and this model. And we're hoping that some of you from elsewhere can learn from what we're doing in Scotland and can maybe use it to shape your own services too. We hope that the eight pillars model will be accepted as a follow-on, as per the, my earlier diagram, from the post-diagnostic support model that we're using in Scotland. We're also at the moment working on a new research report about using the principles that we're applying in the eight pillars model for people whose dementia is very advanced or who are at end of life and so we're hoping to be able to test this approach in the future and we want to also see and, and I'm, I'm hearing this from the people in the health boards and and in the local authorities who I'm talking to who are, who are doing the tests at the moment that they're looking at their test for the eight pillars model as a model for integrating health and social care for people with other conditions as well so the work the pioneering work that we're doing in the field of dementia is actually going to be supporting a far wider group of people who have complex health and social care needs i will finish there i hope that this has provided an overview for you of what we're doing why we're doing it and why the involvement of people with dementia and their supporters benefits policy and benefits practice and helps us make a rights-based approach to dementia an actual reality. Thanks very much.